Praise the Lord. Well, hey, this morning I'm going to continue in the series we started last week and uh, entitled The Healthy Church. And uh, as I had mentioned then, then uh, sometimes in order to discover what a healthy church looks like, it's important to examine and, and kind of see what is the unhealthy church, uh, re- what does that reveal, what does that show? Because uh, what it shows is it reveals the imbalance sometimes in churches where they get unhealthy. And uh, we don't want to be that, right? We don't want to be the unhealthy church. We want to be the healthy church. I want to be a healthy Christian. I think all of you want to be healthy Christians, right? So, so much of life, including our spiritual lives, uh, is, has to do with finding the balance, right? Finding the balance, right? Where, where, where's that balance where I'm not way over here, I'm not way over here, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, right where God would have me to be. And, um, and the verse that always comes to mind when I say that is... Uh, I think I'm on, I'm on. So the verse that I always say that it would be in Ecclesiastes, it's 718, and it's the second half of it, and the writer, most likely Solomon, uh, says this, the man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Mm, think about that. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. And that's where we want to be, church. Hallelujah, right? Amen. So if you stand and honor God's word, And turn to Romans chapter 1. We'll get there shortly. Last Sunday, uh, I discussed four unhealthy churches, which ultimately have their roots in unhealthy people, right? A church is made up of people. It's not these brick and mortar that we have here. It's us people, right? Right. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I'm on there, I think. All right. Um, The first church that was pointed out was the King James only church that we talked about. And I know when I said that, I hear some oohs out there like, what's he going to say about that? But this church reads teaches and preaches from the King James Version only. And as I mentioned, uh, is it important that we maintain the original text of the the writers as they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Of course we need to do that. But when they're with with this type of church, it gets out of balance in that uh, they they believe that all other versions are New Age versions or or from corrupt sources. And uh, that's that's not true. And so um, I would disagree with that, that thinking. Uh, for one, there are multiple ways to say, like I said last week, I'm going to the store and I'll be back quickly. You could say that probably, I could probably say that 10 times and you'd know the two points that I'm, I'm bringing out. And uh, so these well-meaning Christians, these well-meaning folks, um, see themselves, though, as the sole carriers of truth. They think, hey, we have all the truth and we're going to be the carriers of that truth. And you know, However, Jesus has that title of the sole carrier of truth. Amen. <laughs> And it doesn't come from sticking to one version of the Bible, I would say, right? Secondly, I brought up the, the legalistic church. And this is who the, uh, who the Pharisees uh, were in Jesus' day. And boy, remember, as I said last week, he had a heyday, right? Picking those guys apart, right? Because uh, when he walked on the earth, he, he went after those guys. He exposed all their rules and all their laws and all their head knowledge. And really, a lot of it was just hypocritical. And it was, and it was continually exposing their hearts. God's more concerned about our hearts. You ever notice he always goes to the heart, not the, how great knowledgeable we are in the scripture, but what's your heart like? What are you doing? What's going on here? That's what he, that he cares about. That's what, he, that's what he always zeroed in on the, on the Pharisees, and that's what he's, he's concerned about with us. And so Chris, Christianity isn't just a set of rules, okay, uh, that we obey outwardly to show how supposed holy we are. It's a relationship based out of a heart of love for our Savior, and thankful, thankfulness for what he did for us. We obey him because we love him. Amen. Right? Amen. If you love me, you obey me, the Bible says. First John, I believe it is. It's in there many times. The third unhealthy church I discussed was the seeker-friendly church. And this is a church that bends over backwards to make people feel comfortable and meet their needs. The problem with this church and why it's unhealthy is, is because Christianity isn't about us. It really isn't. I know that statement is shocking to the American church because we have a consumer mentality. Hey, if it's not good here, I'll run to the next church. And if they don't fill my coffee cup when I walk in the door, I'll go to the next church. And if they don't greet me, everybody bows down and says how great I am. I'll go to the next church, right? You know what I'm talking about. Come on. I don't see that in the African church. Didn't see that in the Nicaraguan church. They were smiling. They're not a dump. These kids are living in a dump and they're smiling. They come to church smiling and happy. Loving Jesus with all their heart. Wow, that that right there is a message, right? It's not about us, but about Jesus and about others. Growing in our relationship in God and leading others to Jesus Christ. 
like I had the privilege to this week with uh, my good, uh, my buddy's, you know, parents. That was awesome. It's by our actions, by our deeds, by our words. Those are all the things that we can reflect Jesus. Our focus should not be on consuming. Instead, it should be on serving God and others as Jesus came to do. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. If anybody could have come to be served, it'd be Jesus. Hey, yo, I'm Jesus. Bow down, man. I'm cool. You know, don't mess with me, man. I'm here. I'm the, I'm the king of kings and the Lord. Not at all. Not at all. He came to serve. Washing people's feet. Going to a cross. Dying on the cross for our sin. Come on. Last, the unhealthy church I went over last week is the divided church. Power disputes rack this type of church. Usually ending up in a church split, right? And their, their witness to the world is gone in the process. You might as well throw it out the door because they're like, How are these, how's this church any different than the world? They're, they're just arguing and fighting amongst themselves. That's what the world does, right? God works through people who are in unity, right? In a mighty way. Satan works through disunity, doesn't he? He loves, Satan loves church splits. That could be his middle name. Satan church split, right? He loves those things, I'm telling you. He does. And so I'm going to be in, we're going to be in Romans 1. And Paul is writing about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven uh, against all the ungodliness and the wickedness of that day. And so let's read on. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, starting with verse, it should be up here, but starting with verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual immorality, impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the served and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to a shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve those who practice them. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that those that are wrapped up in, in sin and whatever that sin might be, God, today would you speak to them like we prayed earlier. God, I just ask that you would show people that there is, a, there is an end to that and it's not pretty. And so, Father, I'm asking today that your word would go forth as we, as we just go over these things that are unhealthy. And, Lord, we want to ultimately find what's healthy. And so, Lord, speak to our hearts and show us if there's anything out of line in our hearts and our lives. And, Lord, we just want to line up with you. We want to be more like you, and we're going to go after you today. Speak to us, and when we go out of here, may we be changed, but not just out of here, but when we go to our, our, our workplace this week, we go wherever we go, Lord, would you just work in our hearts all week long and speak yeah. to us today. Start that today and just continue to let it grow in Jesus mighty name and all God's children said amen. amen and amen you may be seated in the house of the Lord praise God hallelujah thank you Lord tell your neighbor stay healthy stay amen amen you know I, I picked these controversial verses this morning because it ties into the next unhealthy church that I wanted I want to discuss but let me tell you most preachers today would not even would never even go to those verses at all um, they would just avoid those because uh, they just are really ultimately trying to appease the culture. And so that brings me to number five on the list of unhealthy churches, and that is the affirming church. And this church has the mentality of that no matter what you do and how you live your life, well, God loves you, so you're good just the way you are. Well, while that's true, God loves you. All this type of church does is preach on God's love and grace. That's it. It stops right there. They justify sinful lifestyles and even celebrate those behaviors under the guise that they are an affirming and loving church, not wanting to offend anyone. Well, the imbalance and the problem with that mindset is this. 
the gospel is offensive. The gospel is offensive by its very nature. Before I came to Jesus, the gospel was offensive to me. Because I was a sinner, and until I wanted to hear it, I didn't want to hear it. It was a fan. Like, yeah, keep that stuff away. Talk to the hand, right? Yeah. Jesus himself offended the Pharisees over and over and over, calling yeah. out sin and exposing their hardened hearts, didn't he? Yes, God is a God that loves. The Bible states God is love, Amen. right? He is that very thing. He is the God that offers grace through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I think, you know, most of us, we know that, uh, that love, and we've come into that love. Thank you, Jesus. But what they forget, <clears throat> overlook, or completely ignore throughout the scriptures is that he is also a God of justice. Yes. He is both a God of mercy and a God of justice. He's both. See, there, there is a price for unrepentant sin, the Bible tells us, and that is death, ultimately. It is death, Romans 3.23. Yes. He can't be of God of love without being just. He has a moral standard. In John, it tells us that if we love him, we will obey his commands, as I mentioned earlier. Do you think I'd really be loving my kids if I just let them do whatever they wanted to do? I'd have four hillions on my hand right now, right? If I didn't discipline them, if I didn't uh, set standards and set boundaries, and on and on it goes. I love them. I don't care about their, necessarily about their comfortability and that they get everything they want. I don't care about that at the end of the day. I care that they love Jesus and they're following the word of God and the character principles in that word. Yeah. That's what I care about for my children. And God, I believe, is the same way. God does not look the other way while we defiantly, openly practice sin. There will be a day that, that we will have to answer for our unrepentance and sin and rebellion, right? Here's the thing. Unrepentant sin keeps us from receiving Christ. Yeah. So we're not going to be, when that time comes, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life because we never accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, right? Never, they never get to the place where we realize we are sinners in need of a Savior when, it, when we're in that category. Thankfully, most, if not all, in this room have come to that place, that realization that, that Jesus Christ needs to be Lord of my life, that I am a sinner and I can only get there through a Savior. Hallelujah. Right. He points the, right, the way to God yeah. is through Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to look in the camera while I do this, and I'm going to say this. Maybe you stumbled across uh, our site, you're a pastor of a church, and, and you're pastoring a, a, an affirming church. Is it truly loving to inform, not to inform someone that there are, people are walking off a cliff, and if they keep going in that direction, they will ultimately fall to their death? Is that loving? I don't think so. That's not what affirming churches, I mean, excuse me, that's what they do, what affirming churches do. They allow people to keep walking into the darkness without ever turning on the, the light and exposing the truth. Amen. We'll be responsible for that as teachers. I'm not focusing in on one particular sin or lifestyle here. As shepherds, we need to preach the whole word of God and God's love, right, for others. But we can't affirm lying, we can't affirm stealing, we can't affirm cheating, gossiping, slander, disobeying our parents, and the list goes on and on, right? Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to correctly handle the word of truth. That's right. That goes for us individually as Christians, but for those who are also uh, teachers and pastors, those of us who are that in that category, because as pastors, we'll be held to a higher standard of accountability That's right. That's right. before God. If you're thinking, where did he come up with that? Well, let me tell you, God's word, not mine. James 3.1. Now, many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. It's right there in plain as day, right? It doesn't get any softer or prettier as God speaks to, to his prophet uh, Ezekiel in chapter 33, starting with verse 7. It should be up there on the screen. He says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked man, O wicked man, you will surely die and you, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will, will uh, die for his sin and I will hold you accountable for his blood. Ooh. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. See, the big comeback in our culture is we're not supposed to judge. 
that's true. We're not supposed to judge in our thinking that we are better than others and looking down our long ecclesiastical noses and saying, oh, how can that person do that? Looking down on others with disgust and thinking, oh, these people, I can't believe it. Just remember when you start to do that, and I'll say it for me first, but by the grace of God, there go I. Amen. But by the grace of God, there go I. But pastors, hear me out. This isn't about judging. Our job as teachers and as individual Christians is to speak the truth in love. Amen. Uphold what this word says, right? I, for one, do not want to be a stumbling block to anyone. And I hope all of us as Christians don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. Our neighbors, our friends, our family. Because let me just say this, they're watching you. Amen. Whether you know it or not, they're watching you. They see you get in that car on Sunday morning. Oh, there goes those Christians. Oh, there they go. And look at them thinking they're all holy. Got their Bible, got their dress on. They think they're all that in a bag of chips. Look at them. Look at them, Margo. Would you look at those guys? But when they see you come knocking on their apartment door, going to the next door to your neighbor and say, hey, I'm glad you moved in. We brought, got you some cookies here. How you doing? Is there anything you can eat? Anything? Boy, these Christians are a little different than I thought they were. I thought they were all just takers and yeah, mean people. But boy, these people are loving. They're kind. They're gentle. They have the fruits of the Spirit, right? So if I'm going to affirm you, church, I'm going to affirm you for going out all after God. That a, that a boy, that a girl, one of those things, we get, that a boy, that a girl, you know. I'm going to affirm you for that. I'm going to affirm you for going after and reading God's word and obeying his word and following the principles in the word. There's nothing better for a pastor to, to see or a Christian, one of, his, one, of the, one of the congregants, coming to him saying, you know, pastor, God showed me this and he showed me that and I'm growing in here. There's nothing sweeter to, to a pastor's ear for, the, for those that are in the body of Christ that are growing in God. That's an awesome thing. That's what, that's what we like to see all of us growing. That's what I want to be doing, of course. But Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 4, to preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Mm -hmm. mm. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Church, that time has come, and it's here in 2021. Oh, yeah. It's already here. Trust me. Many have turned away, even in the church, and gone back the way of the world. I don't get that. I think, man, I was in the world doing crazy stuff. What do I want to, there's nothing to go back to. What, what do I want to go back to? Oh, yeah, hanging over a boil, oh, hanging over a bowl all day, hung over, headaches. Oh, that was so great. It was just so much fun. No, it was empty. It was empty. It was with void. That's why I came to Jesus. There was a void. It was never getting filled. It would not get filled because the world can't fill what only Jesus Christ can fill. Hallelujah. Amen. Only he can fill it, church. Only he can fill it. Hallelujah. That's why it is all the more important we speak the truth in love and affirm people as they go after God. That's why we're here as a church body to encourage and lift each other up and support each other and say, man, I'm, I'm here for you. How can I pray for you? What can I do for you? How can I be there for you? That's why we're here. It's not just about Sunday morning and then we don't see each other the rest of the week. No, we're engaged. I'm going to call so-and-so. God's put Sister Beulah on my heart. I'm going to call Sister Beulah and see how she's doing. I wonder how Wilbur's doing. I'm going to call Wilbur and just see what he's happening. Hey, Wilbur, what are you doing? Man, I want to pray with you. I just, man, God's putting you on my heart. Stuff like that. That's the body of Christ coming together, growing each other up in the faith. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. Number six, unhealthy church I'm going to discuss is just the opposite church of the affirming church, and that is the fire and brimstone church. To this church, it's all about judgment with very little mention of God's grace. His love and his mercy. If you put your socks on the wrong feet, you're going to double H E double hockey stick. You guys didn't get that one. Never mind. Yeah. They wouldn't they wouldn't be nice. They would just say, You're going to hell. That's what they would say, right? And most of the time in those places. I'm joking, of course, but in every in every service, you're looking up not for Jesus' return as we should be looking for, right? You're not looking for that. You're looking for God's hammer to come down and nail you for something you just did or thought, right? That's what you're thinking, right? He's going to smite me for all the terrible things that I've done. The big ogre in the sky. That's right, right? Wow. 
Rarely, if ever, you'll hear Psalms 103, verse 8, preached in that kind of church, and it's this. It says, the Lord is compassionate, the Lord is gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Amen. And that's not the only time it's in the Bible. It says it's a little bit of variation of that, but it's in there many, many times. And when it's in there many times, God's starting to try to speak to us and show us something. Amen. And so thank you, Lord, for that. You, you won't even hear the most commonly quoted and memorized scripture in all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God... So love the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? In this unhealthy church, when the pastor delivers a message that thunders with judgment, right? He or she gets lots of kudos and approvals and compliments. Good job, good preaching, pastor. You're the man, you're the man, pastor. Go get him, pastor. Sick him, right? God forbid if they were to preach a message on compassion, love, or mercy, which they rarely do, by the way. But if the preacher does, that congregation is quick to accuse them of not preaching the truth anymore. You're not preaching the truth because you're not pointing the finger and you're not going after people all day long. In essence, what they're saying is, if you're not rebuking and you're not reproving, then what you're saying can't be the gospel. Right. Hmm. Remember, he's also a God of love, right? The fire and brimstone church believes you can only beat bully or fear people into submitting their lives to Christ. That may have worked at a certain time, but let me just tell you, church, it doesn't work today. It doesn't work at all today. People don't do it. it just they'll, they'll repel them, right? Usually when that's going on, that's exactly what happens. They want to get away from us and get away from the church and get away from the preacher. It doesn't draw. It just draws them away from his house and, and the word of God. People feel like they can never measure up to God's standards. Oops, I'm getting a little reverb, but anyway, praise the Lord. Echo, right? We can't measure up on our own anyway because it's what Christ did because of his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Amen? Amen. For us. The example that always comes to me when I think of this is, is good old Central Michigan University where I was not walking with the Lord more than uh, Batman was, I don't know, whatever. But I just was not walking with the Lord, okay, at all. So... On campus, we had uh, the uh, library, and uh, Scott, you'll know what I'm talking about. You went there. We had the library, and across from the library was this little hill, almost like a big ant hill, but it was about this high. And one day, I'm walking by there, and there's some guys standing on that hill. And they're going, you're all going to hell, and you need to repent, and you need to go have Jesus. And they're screaming, and turn or burn. They had that message going on, you know. And so as students were walking by, uh, some would show them their IQ with their finger. You guys will get that later. Uh, some were reacting uh, with uh, these saying things that weren't Christian, that they weren't taught in the classroom to these guys. Some would suggest not nicely where they could go, and it wasn't heaven. Okay? Later that week, I was walking by the same spot, uh, going to that same, or that same class, probably Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, you know how those things are. And guess who was there on the hill? And not even on the hill, actually, they were on the walkway. So the hill's over here, the library's over there, there's the walkway where all the students are going. Guess who was there? The Gideons. The Gideons were there. What were they doing? They were handing out New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs, Bibles. And they, I took one, I put it in my dresser drawer, never looked at it the rest of college, but that's beside the point, okay? But not only did I take it, but I noticed that nearly every student that walked by took one of those Bibles. Interesting. Who's planting more seeds? Who's doing more for the kingdom of God? Amen. They were being the hands and feet of Jesus. Of course, we preach there's a heaven and a hell, obviously. But it shouldn't come through shaming, guilting, fearing, condemning. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind. Right? There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. Right? God doesn't shame us. He doesn't condemn us. He does all those things. Right? And we don't solely focus on that, right? It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. I know. I've tried to play the Holy Spirit's job. It doesn't work. Let it go. Let God just pray for them. Keep moving along. And when the door opens, just live your life for Jesus and keep moving. But when it's open, move in, right? But the fire and brimstone church does a better job at turning and driving people away than it does drawing them to Jesus. That brings us to the seventh and final church I'm going to discuss, and that is the unhealthy church, which is the comfortable church. Has anybody ever been in a comfortable church? It is based on good works, and this church, in my opinion, is sending more people to hell, really, to a life of eternity away from God than anything else. They make people feel comfortable in their sin 
and they may even preach against sin, but the problem is the church never tells them how to get free and how to be saved and how to get out of their sin. They never give an altar call. They never say anything about Jesus and this is the way and the, you know, how we get there, right? That's important, church. We can talk about it all day long, but if we don't say, well, hey, this is your answer, here's your answer, I can say the problem, but if I don't have an answer, they lull people to sleep spiritually into thinking they're going to heaven because they're a good person. We'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. Or if they go to church or are part of the denomination or do good works, they will get to heaven. Right. Or in the occult world, if a person reaches to a certain position in the religion, or if they reach a level of holiness, or they pray three times a day, or, or certain, they have a certain state of mind, blah, 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 they're going to they're gonna work and earn their way to salvation. Have you ever noticed everything but uh, Christ, true Christianity tries to work its way there somehow, some way? Exactly. It's only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and we know it's by faith and gra grace and by faith through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So salvation is based on what they do, uh, not on what Jesus did. My answer to all that is, if any of that, if, if any of that is true, what is the point of God the Father sending his only son to die a gruesome death on a cross for our sins? There's really no point if we could just do it on our own, right? There's no point at all. I think God's a whole lot smarter than that. I think he's got a little more intellect than that. He's a whole lot smarter than us, so I think he's got a whole lot of intelligence, amen? But there's a reason for him sending his son, and it's found in Romans 3, 23. And it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? It's also for Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Hallelujah. How about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, right? This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by your works so that no man can boast. Right? It's from God. God gave us a way out of this sentence of sin, Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. There it is. We used to call it the Romans road. That's it, the Romans road. You take him right down there, you can. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I believe in my heart that God you know, died for me, and I ask him with my mouth to forgive me of my sins and come into my life. That's, it's that simple. Amen. Some people go, it's that simple? A little prayer like that? No, i gotta, I got to clean myself up. i got to do all this stuff. i gotta, you know, I got to come. Let, no, 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 just come as you are in that regard. Just come as you are. God does the cleaning up. Amen. You just let him reel you in, right? He's out there fishing. And a lot of people keep fighting. And guess what happens when you fight in the water? It's a whole lot of this, man. It's a whole lot of this. When you surrender, Jesus just goes, whoo, whoo, whoo. you come on the hook. He takes you off. He says, okay, now I'm going to clean you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do what I need to do in you. Because you surrender now and you just gave up the fight. It's kind of a good way to picture to think of that, right? God is good that way. Hallelujah. Yes, Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. So it, it's very clear that we were in trouble before Jesus came to this earth, and of course, before he died and rose again. The comfortable church doesn't see a need for a Savior because they don't even see that they're a sinner. You know, I'm a pretty good person. Uh, you know, I helped my uh, Aunt Betty, and I went next door and helped the old, I shoveled the old ladies. Uh, I'm good. They think they're good people. The problem with that thinking is it doesn't line up with scriptures. Now, I'm not saying you can't do good things and, you know, all those things, but it doesn't line up with scriptures when it comes to our salvation. Even Jesus responded uh, in Mark chapter 10 this way to a man who ran up to him, fell on his knees before him, and called him a good teacher. Jesus answered him uh, and said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. If that's not enough to convince a person of that, then maybe what the prophet Isaiah in chapter 64 said, and it's this, all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Ooh, I don't know about you, but I don't really like filthy rags. They don't do much for me. They're kind of nasty. You want to just throw the rag out when it's done if it's really nasty, you know what I'm saying? Thank God Jesus doesn't throw us out, though, when he sees how filthy we are. He, he looks at us and says, man, I'm going to clean that up. It's going to be just like when you bought that thing at Bed Bath & Beyond. It's going to be shining clean, right? Amen. That's what he does. Hallelujah. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But Christ paid the ultimate price for our salvation. 
He wasn't comfortable at all, right? And that shouldn't be our goal. Jesus wasn't comfortable. He could have got himself comfortable, I suppose, but he wasn't. He knew the things he said to those religious leaders were going to pay, cost him the price. And the ultimate price was the death on the cross. They knew that. Yep. Religion won't save us. Going to church won't save us. No more than going to your garage will make you a car. Going to McDonald's will make you a hamburger. You know, you've heard that saying before, right? Although we do need to be in the house of God. Amen. And being a good person won't save us because we just read why that's not possible. As born-again believers, our walk with God is not just about coming to church on Sunday. He's the Lord of everything every day. Amen. Our goal should never be to get comfortable. Instead, it ought to be to get holy and get hungry for more of God each and every day that we go after him. Hallelujah. All right, I need to bring this to a close. And uh, let me just say this. Maybe you have been hurt by somebody that's unhealthy in the church, and that happens. Because people, Christians aren't perfect. They do hurt people, and they do still. They're a work, we're all a work in progress. And so sometimes people get hurt by something somebody said. Let me just, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You go to church long enough, let me just tell you, I can guarantee you 100% chance you're going to get hurt by somebody before it's all over. Yep. Yep. But you don't pick up your toys and go home. That's what four-year-olds do. Yep. You just say, I'm going to bust through. I'm going to forgive that person. I'm going to love on that person as best as I can. Lord, give me a love for that person. I'm going to keep moving on. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So maybe you've been hurt by some. And maybe they were well-meaning. Maybe they weren't well-meaning Christians. I don't know. You know, they did something that hurt you, and you just can't get over it. But it's, you've got to get over it because Jesus forgave us. How can we not forgive others? Amen. We've got to get over those things. That wasn't Jesus, right? Hallelujah. And then just because believers do that, the Lord won't do that to you. He's not going to hurt you. He's there to help you, to love you, to bring you to the next place and the next spot in him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. And so if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, today's a great day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And so this is a good day as any. So I'm going to ask you to click on our playlist entitled More About a Personal Relationship with Jesus Christ. And as you do that, it will guide you through the process and make, to make that a reality in your life. And let us know. We'll get you a booklet called Brand New that will help you with your next 30 days in your walk with Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Aren't you thankful for Jesus, church? Amen. Amen. Give it up for the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He's waiting on us. He says, I stand at the door and knock. Right? If you, anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with you. Hallelujah. Praise God. With that, that's a good segue. I didn't even realize that, but it's a great segue. Because we're going to have food after church. And, uh, and so I'm not going to give a closing prayer, but uh, we have some kind of dinner going on back there. But the gals asked me to announce that we need a few moments to get things ready. So if you could just fellowship, uh, maybe do a cartwheel, whatever you want to do, just hang out, spend some time. And uh, whatever you want to do, talk to each other, love on each other. We're going to have a dinner after that. We'll pray. Uh, let's just pray for that meal. I guess we could pray for it right now. Father, thank you for, uh, thank you for our time together today, our fellowship we're going to have. And Lord, I just ask that you'll help us build relationships with maybe some people we don't, haven't built a relationship with in this church yet. Lord, let that be the day. Let us sit with somebody else today and get to know somebody else today as we're sitting down and, and just uh, having fellowship with one another. But Lord, I also pray that uh, you'll bless the food to our body, but I also pray this week that uh, you will just go before us and Lord, you will just see your hand doing great things. Let there be testimonies coming out of this church uh, of people coming to Christ, people coming back to Christ, using us in a powerful way, Lord, and helping us be the church so that we can come back and share all the good things God's done this week. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And I won't say go, stay, and wait for the food. Amen.